Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Colton Becker. Colton, are you ready to be great today? Oh, always. Thank you for having me on, Jason. Colton was born in Vail, Colorado in October 1981. He spent most of the time as a kid playing hockey, hunting, fly fishing, and other outdoor activities. Colton went on to the College of Colorado School of Mines, where he studied environment engineering, joined Army RTC, and following graduation in December 2018, was commissioned to active duty active duty Army Infantry. After the Army, Colton became an entrepreneur. His current company, Melorium, hopefully I can pronounce that right, is what he's working on now. Colton, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jason. So, Colton, let's go back to your childhood real fast. So, you did a lot of outdoor activities, hockey, fly fishing, golfing, hunting. Is there a favorite out of all those? <laughs> It's seasonally dependent. Um, I enjoy fly fishing in the summer when it's nice and warm out and you can just wet wade. Uh, I grew up playing hockey predominantly. Um, that's winter sport back where, you know, back in Colorado, same with skiing. So, um, you know, all of those kind of have their seasons. Um, and so those are kind of what I pick from, you know, like that's my favorite given that season. So, so no. <laughs> so what, what kind of hunting do you do? I, do, do, do you still hunt? I do actually. I'm going uh, October, beginning of October. I'm going to Wyoming to hunt with a couple of army buddies of mine from my third platoon uh, that I had. So really looking forward to that big game hunting for elk. Elk. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if you know John Neff. He, he used to be a sealer here in the VIR. He's actually a, I, I might be going elk hunting with him in October, November. Oh, cool. Where Ellis, yeah, I've never been before. I just want to like you know, oh, be, yeah. a, be a man's man. You know, like it's uh, so um. <laughs> It took me seven years to actually find and, and be able to shoot an elk when I was growing up and hunting with my dad. And he, he always had this thing that he'd say is like, well, the fun's over the second you finally actually shoot him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cause you're like, you got that anticipation. You're like, ah, oh, let, let me, let me find one. Let me get into that herd. And then when you finally do, it's, it turns out they're, they're not easy to hunt. I heard they're like, it's kind of like, a, a, they're, they're like pretty good at it. Right. Oh yeah, they can be up and over about three or four ridge lines in about twenty minutes. They're quick animals, and they're uh, <laughs> they're definitely made for going up and down steep mountains. Um. So you you how often do you go hunting? Uh. Well, frequently or um, recently has actually gone down to about once a year. Um, you know, with uh, you know, life transitions and whatnot, you sort of things start to fall to the wayside and hunting was one of those things that kind of fell to the wayside for a little while, but the last about three years, four years now, um, I've hunted once each year with this same group of folks. So it's starting to look like it's becoming a tradition. So is hunting kind of like golfing, like golfing, like you can't go golf everyone, right? You, I mean, you don't want to spend like eight hours on a golf course with three people you don't like is I'm guessing hunting's the same way. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you get up there in the woods, you're going to be in the woods there for a while. <laughs> um, I mean, Granted, if you've got that buddy that, you know, doesn't shut up, hunting kind of necessary to shut up. So yeah. um, it, it, you can build that little bit of silence and, and uh, peaceful meditation, so to speak, into it, which is pretty nice. So I'm guessing there's a different way to hunt elk versus deer versus like small game. Yeah, the, the style that I've adapted across my couple of years doing it was more like a stocking approach. Um, I have. You find a track, you find a trail uh, that's fresh, and then you just try to creep nice and quietly through the woods, you know, and uh, sneak up on it. And um, I've done that uh, about three times where I've actually been able to sneak up within about a hundred yards of, of an elk that was bedded down. Um, but those weren't the, the times where I actually converted and, and, and got the kill. Um, so you know, one of those, I, I was um, I was up above Muddy Ridge in Colorado, and I had been hunting with my dad in the morning, and there was no success. He's more of like a static. I'm gonna sit here, let the animals come to me. I'm in a nice you know, place that's got food, shelter, and water, or is a highly trafficked. Some bourbon. Animal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you throw a little bit of that in the coffee in the morning. Coffee help warm you up. You know. Um, I'm, you know, I was a young buck, so to speak, and I, I couldn't sit still. I was having too much fun. And so I was said, Hey dad, I'm going for a walk. I'm finding something. I gotta, I, I gotta move around. And he's, 
the old wise experienced hunters said, all right, but like, that's, you're probably not going to find anything because these are smart animals and you know, they, they can hear and smell you and see you. And so I said, well, you know, whatever, I'll just go ahead and give it a shot. And so I managed to find a trail and uh, I wandered on it for about three and a half miles until I finally came up on a cow, elk and a calf. And, you know, it was in dense, thick vegetation, dark timber, um, you know, evergreen type trees. And so it's pretty thick and it was all snowy on the ground. So you can, you can actually hide your footprints. You can, um, or your sound, it doesn't sound too bad, right? Like you, you don't have a lot of sound when you're moving through the woods. So I was able to get within about 20 yards actually of those elk. Um, so I go to bring up my rifle and everything to try to shoot and, safety's on, scope caps are on, total mess, total wreck. They get up, they are spooked and they, they continue on. So I'm all discouraged. I'm like, oh man, you dope. What's, what happened? <laughs> you know? And i um, like, well, let's just keep on following the track, right? You know, they're there. So keep following. So I did and find them again. And uh, this time I'm like, Am I, am I ready? Nope. Same sort of problem. Scope cap on the front of my rifle was messed up. So, you know, it's, those are the kinds of experiences that you capture through life that help you going on the next time, you know, your next um, situation where you're like, oh, well, let's check those sorts of things before we, uh, you know, before we get into the woods. So random crest, like when you go elk hunting and kind of hunting, like those are like six of you hunting, right? And one person gets an elk. Does that person take all the meat home? Do you divide it up? Is there some kind of a hunter's etiquette with that? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's um, you know, sort of just be a good guy, right? You know, like you're going hunting with your friends. You're not going to chip your friends for meat, right? Um, so it's, you, if you chip in, you help out with like gutting it or you help out um, quartering it and carrying it out, then you, know, you, you earned your keep a little bit there. And so that's sort of the, the notion is um, they tend to be small enough groups that, spreading out a 2,000 pound. Like elk, that's a lot, is, that's, isn't that's that a lot of meat. Deal? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Only, only thing I know about elk hunting is from Joe Rogan tells stories, his podcast, and he'll like, he'll hunt, like he does a bow, you know, he'll hunt and get an elk and he'll have like meat like three years later. Right. Oh yeah. So like, yeah. It fills your freezer. That's no joke. I mean, um, the, the way I've done it, I, I quarter the, the animals. Right. So that's when you, you cut it open and you, take off the arms and the legs and whatnot and the front quarters tend to be lighter the rear ones that's where most of the power right the transit power for that animal is and so those ones are nice and hefty and heavy and uh it's you know envision your your heaviest army pack you've ever had and that's about what you're hiking out and you got about at least two maybe three of those so cut what do you come back to people who say like you're hunting animals you're doing, you're doing evil things. This is not right. They're living creatures, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I mean, all living creatures work and, and live within an environment, right? And um, it's, it's, you know, hunting is a part of that animal's daily life. Um, they're trying to survive against predators, what, you know, their own natural predators. And if you remove a predator from a ecosystem, then there's nothing to keep that population in check, right? So that's where you start to see a population explode and it starts to exploit its environment. And ultimately what you end up with is a crash of that ecosystem, a crash of that population. So hunting, in my view, especially the way that you have wildlife managers, you know, Department of Fish and Wild Game, um, you know, each state has their own version of that. They, they come in there and they regulate it down to the T because they don't want those. Yeah. Cause it's not like you can go crash. hunting for elk every single day of the year. You can kill all the elk you want. There's like exactly. limits and rules and stuff. Right. So we learn America learned from their mistakes during westward expansion during the frontier years when hunters got the negative stigma that's still associated by sport hunting bison and killing off that in, in Buffalo and killing off that entire population. Um, you know, and so that's, that's where that negative stigma was associated, like came from in my view. And it still carries on today, but you know, hunting today is, is well-regulated and it's an ethical practice. And the ethical hunter does his or her best to make sure that it's a clean kill, it's a quick kill, and that you know, there, there's no suffering on the, 
um, it, there's no suffering for the animal, right? And so, um, I mean, people forget that we're actually part of the ecosystem too, right? We're part of there too. I mean, exactly. of course, now we're part of the top of it, but back in the day, like we weren't on top, right? Probably cougars and mm -hmm. bears and other things are the top of top of the list, right? Oh yeah, you're getting into one of my like core theses on life. Uh, as as an environmental engineer uh, and and an avid outdoorsman, you know that's really what started my my passion for the out or the passion for the outdoors is what started me down the path of being an environmental engineer and really caring for that environment and looking at how humans interact. Um, I think that we've got this notion that we're a little bit more superior um, because of the dominance of our brain, right? And we've we've kind of pushed ourselves outside of nature and have this idea that we're separate from it um, and the natural order. And my view, that's not the case. You can see that when you, you know, you, you ask or you say, Hey, you know, like we're animals too. And if somebody has that like frown that appears on their face, like, no, we're not. <laughs> that's yeah. that in my view is somebody not accepting the fact that we also are animals, we have a part to play in the ecosystem and we have a, you know, we have superior brain power. So because of that, we've been able to craft machines and societies that no longer really fear animal predators. And in essence, we've become our own. Yeah. And plus the fact no one really goes hunting anymore either. Right. So they really don't know, like they get the food out of you know, whatever the grocery stores have yeah. no idea. They have no idea what the, what's it called? The food trail, the food, whatever it's called. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just that whole farm to table notion, yeah. you know, the same idea, hunting it to your own table, you know? So it, there's a lot of convergence with folks that want to be self-reliant and, and be able to have the skills necessary to, to, you know, in the absence of all of the, the niceties of society, of modern society, you know, in the absence of that, being able to, to yeah. If you to think about it, if you put like like a human being with like like a lion of tigers, bears, all the different predator animals, right? With a gun and some weapons, okay, you probably put your money on the man, right? Yeah. However, comma, if it's just them, like no clothes, no nothing, them by themselves, like I don't know, like because like what do we really have? Like you're not gonna fight a bear one on one or take a tiger out, right? I mean, it's like so the thing that humans have is this little guy up mm -hmm. here, right? The, the imagination and the ability to look at the natural world and go make some spears out of wood and stuff. How can I use Hope you have some time to make spears out of wood. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. You throw, you throw a human and a bear in a cage, right. And like, you just have a cage fight going on. Yeah. Like that's, that's where you see that we aren't the keystone predator. What makes us that keystone predator and allows us to have moved out of, you know, the, the, the daily struggle, so to speak, of survival is our brain and the, the ability to harness that to make tools for our own aid. Every, you know, everything that we have is either a tool to advance our own position or a luxury that stemmed from having a tool to be able to advance your position, right? So like a pencil, you know, that's a tool to learn how to write or to learn how to read, to communicate. And Look at, you know, every business nowadays, you have to be able to communicate. You have to know how to read. You have to know how to write to advance your product. You know, so you're using tools to generate profits, to, you know, live a comfortable existence. So when you go hunting, do you do like old school way, like go camp on the ground or you, or you do the glam way? You take your RV out and like, you know, uh, Oh, do you want to, are you, are you, are you, don't, you don't want to answer that question? Uh, no, no, I'm fine answering it. You know, I, I, I've done enough suffering, you know, sleeping on tree roots as yeah, pillows I'm and the same stuff way. that, um, I know I can do it and I choose the, I choose the comfortable life because yeah. there's no, there's no ego involved in that for me. You know, like I've proven it to myself and anybody else who's going to say, Oh, you know, you're, you're being a wimp. Mm. I'm like, well, have you gone to ranger school twice? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I have, you know, like I've, I've slept on tree roots. I've yeah, gotten I, zero. I, I, sleep I would never understand why people in the military go camping or go like the old school camp. <laughs> I just don't get like, you didn't have enough of that in, in the military. Like, yeah, I spent plenty of nights on the ground freezing, like 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, like this, I'm, I'm being confronted with that exact thing right now because this trip that I'm getting ready for in October is going to be a backpacking trip. And when I found out about that, I was like, oh man, come on. (laughs) That's my past. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's also, I think beneficial to, to have those experiences again from time to time so that you remember, um, you know, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nice to have that kind of in the back pocket, that, that experience so that you can draw on it um, when times get tough. And, and I've found throughout my life, that's kind of the way that I've, I've trained for either, you know, running races or for the military is uh, train heavy and endure, you know, the, endure the crappiness make it even crappier than what you're trying to train for Mm -hmm. so that when you get to that um you know race or when you get to the start of whatever training event like ranger school for me you have past experiences to draw on to say you know that was shittier than this is going to be or this is so i can keep on going so it's a that's how i've crafted my life to be able to you know be gritty, so to speak, and mm-hmm. persevere. And, and that's where my determination stems from is train heavy, heavier than you're going to be experiencing in the event that you're training for. Yeah. So last question about hunting. One, one thing, like, of course, it, people would say you need to teach this in schools, teach that in schools. Of course, I can't teach everything, right? Mm-hmm. But I've always been a firm believer that they should teach some kind of hunting in school, right? If you're thinking about most hunters are hunters because their parents or grandparents are hunters. Yeah. Like, it's very rare you see someone like, just pops out of nowhere at 25, I'm gonna go hunting, right? With no other mm-hmm. hunter, like, so, and I think if, yeah. if more people know about hunting, there would be no, no gun regulations, how they're good and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really, really good point. Uh, so me, all my, the hunters I know, their parents are hunters. All people who don't hunt, they're like, yeah. oh, I don't have guns. Like, have you been around a gun? Well, they see guns that kill people or do robberies. Yeah. They don't see the guns, it's like a, I won't say a culture, but people go around it, they're, you know, safety courses, yeah. you know? No, you're, you're, you're totally right. Um, you know, I think back on my upbringing and I still have my little 22 rifle that I learned to shoot on that my dad got me when I was I think about seven or eight. Um, fall used to be the, the best time of the year for me because that meant that when my dad was going to sight in his hunting rifle, I got to go to the shooting range with him. And that's you know, where you start to learn or that's where in today's society, um, you start to learn those healthy rules and respect for, for firearms and weapons. And, um, yeah, cause lots of, lots of states that, you know, everyone knows when the deer season starts mm-hmm. like in Texas, everyone knows when dove season starts, you know, like, yeah, I, well, one of my, my buddies, Daniel Dotson, he, um, he's from Ohio and, you know, deer season rolls around school shuts down. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you can know, no one's going to be in school. Like you're not going to like, we do something dumb, like have like a major test on the first day of, of first day of deer season or honey uh, season, right? No. Nah. Like, are you kidding me? Right? Because nobody's going to show up. Nope. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think that that would be, you know, that, that'd be a creative step forward to try to, um, you know, tease out some, some valuable life experiences for folks. Yeah. But like I having said, like they can't teach everyone says, Oh, keep art and, and crafts in school. Keep, keep home in economics, do coding. You can't teach everything, right? Like that's so. True. So what's the yeah. what's the point? You know, I don't know. Yeah, you know it. Well, it could be an introduction. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, now we're kind of getting down into like the tactical level yeah. ideas. But like, if you made it just like so, I, actually, let me let me expand upon that. When yeah. I was in, in school, um, in elementary school, growing up in in Vail, Colorado, one of the you know best ski resorts in the world. Uh, Bale Resorts actually had a program, it was called Learn to Ski, where they would sponsor all of the elementary schools and middle schools throughout the valley for about two, three days worth of skiing for all the kids. So they would outfit them with ski boot rentals and ski rentals and whatnot, um, or snowboarding if they preferred that, and they would give them free access to the mountain. So it was introducing them to the joy and the experience, right? And the recreational activity. So it could be the same sort of thing. Like yeah. that, Cause that, that was extremely beneficial. I thought. And then uh, think of like a business perspective, they, maybe they did not, but it'd be like, okay, pay for all these kids skiing. Some of these kids are going to keep skiing and maybe ski instructors exactly. for us for a course later on, you know, exactly. have a good relationship, you know, you're investing in a, 
you're you're it's it's like marketing and an investment yeah you're just growing your industry in that case you know that that was totally what veil resorts was doing so next um let's talk about your army career specifically talk about your range of stories <laughs> yeah because that's that's a good some good stories right there talk about perseverance and grittiness and stick to it so that kind of yeah. stuff kind of like people don't know like ranger school it's 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 to say it's not easy to understand me, right? I've never been under attempted being involved to OCS for like different military stuff. So yeah. I probably done like one percent of ranger school, but you hear the stories. When I'm to OCS, the ranger school right next to us, right? So you, you see them, mm-hmm. how much it sucks, you know, just the crap y'all go through. And it's it's yeah, it's I have a lot of respect for rangers. <laughs> um yeah, it, it 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 was simultaneously the best and worst experience of my life. Um and it was the only thing that I had failed in my life, really. Um, only thing of consequence, I should say. Um, so, you know, my story began January 3rd. So I, I was a winter ranger. Yeah, um, people don't want to know Georgia. I can tell you Georgia gets mighty cold in the wintertime. Yeah, you might think it's like nice and warm. It gets freaking cold in the wintertime. Oh, yeah. And... Day one, uh, they have you jump into Victory Pond. Uh, so you do the combat water survival test. And so you're, you, know, you just got done doing your ranger physical assessment test. At, you, know, you start at like 2 in the morning, something outrageous. Honestly, I've forgotten. I can, maybe I blacked it out, blocked it out. I don't know. The memory can do crazy things. Uh, but after you, you smoke yourself trying to you know, pass the physical fitness test, you get a change of clothes and then you run down about a mile and a half to Victory Pond. And you do this, this um, you, you climb up this tall 35 foot structure. You got to walk across a six inch balance beam. This thing's moving, by the way. It's not like it's steady and stationary. You're like, yeah, they've got it drilled in the ground, but it's like, it's over Victory Pond. And you're walking and they're like, walk normal, Ranger. And you, crawl out to this rope and then you hang off of a ranger tab you do a pull up and you drop into the water and the minute you hit that water your breath's gone because it's cold as shit right and that's like that that's the intro but that sort of starts to drive home this notion like yeah this is going to be uncomfortable get used to that uncomfortable feeling drive through it and so that first ranger school experience um i didn't I didn't really adopt that mindset. I, I, and that's why I failed, honestly. Um, what I've noticed is that you've got to want to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and if you don't have that drive, you don't have that desire, if it's not something that's all consuming, at least for me, um, then you're going to find the excuses. You're going to find the places to quit. And you're going to say, you know, I don't want to be here. And so, so culture, we're fast. Why did you go to ranger school? Because they told you to, because you wanted to, yeah. or it was something you were supposed to do, yeah. or something that you really wanted to do at first? Yeah, so the career path of an infantry officer, after you go to infantry basic officer leadership course, after you commission, they send you to ranger school, right? You're right there. You, you got done, you got your, um, you got your commission, you got your essentially graduation, you're ready to go, you could get sent off into the active duty army, but you're at Benning, so it makes sense send all of these infantry guys to ranger school. And when I graduated I Bullock, for some reason, I wasn't mentally ready. I knew it, but I said, well, shit, let's just give this a shot and see how it pans out. And my not ready mindset, my, you know, let's just give it a shot, took me as far as Florida, right to the cusp, right? I made it straight through to Florida phase, the last phase. And you know, basically it, it's akin to being on the one yard line, you know, and a, you know, it's the fourth quarter and last play and, you know, it, looking back on it, essentially I was just smoked, you know, I was done and I said, I don't want to do this. And so I, I got a drop from the course, um, after failing patrols and, um, that was the lowest I'd ever been in my life, right? Because what ranger school is meant to do is to make you feel the worst you've ever been in your life and see what you do at that point. Yeah, because ranger school is, at, at its core, a leadership school, right? Yeah, it's small unit tactics. So, but it's leadership. 
by using small unit tactics, you know, so that infantry battle drills and whatnot are just the medium or the mechanism that they use to try to tease out these leadership traits and lessons. And, you know, that's, that never quit ethos and mindset, you know, readily will I display the intestinal fortitude required to fight onto the ranger objective you know, and complete the mission, though I be the lone survivor. You know, rangers lead the way. That's the last stanza of the creed. That is the school summed up. But where do you find that intestinal fortitude? And that comes down to your own personal soul searching. And uh, I, it took me a long time after I you know, dug this hole, because that's what they do. They, they, they dig this big hole, they put you down there and they say, you're at your worst. And the goal is when gra you graduate, you know, you, you've, you've built yourself back up. You've come out of this, this pit of. And not despair. only are you worse, you, you're worse. You still got to take care of other people, right? Yeah. You still got to be the leader. You're, you're worse. You're you care yourself, but then you still got to be confident, be a leader enough to, to take care of everyone else in your patrol. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you, you know, if you've. So I'm guessing like, it pretty much kills all kind of selflessness, right? Yeah. The school does. Right. So that's where you, you learn this mindset to give more than you get, right? Because if you're not in that leadership position, you're a follower. And if you're not given your best, if you're not helping out your buddy, who's in a leadership position, he's going to take note of that, or she's going to take note of that. And when it comes your turn to lead, you've lost your credibility. You've lost your, your, your respect in their eyes. And they don't want to do anything for you. And so, you know, that's one of the core values that I'm trying to bring over to, to my company. Uh, you know, give more than you get or give greater than you get. Um, how long is Ranger School? Well, that depends on how I mean, well if, you know those lessons. Yeah, if, if you if, I, I don't, I don't, I can't think, I don't, I personally don't know anyone who made, made it through the first time, right? But what if you made it through the first time, what's the course? Like a couple months or? Yeah, it's 63 days. Okay, so it's but, really not that long. Well, so however, comma, yeah, 63 days pretty much means like 24 hours a day, right? It's like, no, you got it. You nailed it right on the head. Um, you know, when, when, you, when the normal person hears, oh yeah, 63 days, that's nothing, right? Yes. You're filtering that through the perspective. You're thinking nine of, to five, weekends off. Yeah, exactly. You're like, oh, okay. I'm going to wake up at, you know, six, going to go to sleep at like 10, maybe 11. No, nah, uh-uh. You've got 24 hours. And so that's six, roughly, you know, 18 hour day, that's six extra hours, you know? So if you do the math there quick, I'm not going to attempt it's math and yeah. which is terrible, right? You can see that those 63 days of ranger school actually end up being a lot longer. And I'm sure the instructors make it tougher, you know, on purpose too, right? You do, do, do different things like oh, yeah. kind of mess with, you know? Oh, not kind of, they definitely do, yeah. right? And that's, that's their mandate. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to make it uncomfortable. They're supposed to make you stressed in the way that they, the levers that they have are food, um, the environment, and your sleep. Right. And yeah. that ratchets up the stress level that's put on the, all the students and they want to see what you do when you're there. Are you going to keep fighting? Are you mm -hmm. going to keep clawing and digging deep and you know, never quitting? Yeah. Or are you going to, going to give up? Right. Cause at the end of the day, you're not a failure until you quit yeah. until you stop putting yeah. in. The I, I, I say like entrepreneurship all the time. You, you're not a fit entrepreneur until you quit. Exactly. You know? Right. And so that's why there's this, this big, you know, that that's, I think in, at its core, what Bunker Labs is trying to, you know, trying to show the world is that veterans, our ethos has been never quitting, mm -hmm. right? You know, the warrior ethos, that's one of those tenets, no matter what part of the military you're in, that is a, a central theme. And Bunker wants to show that. Yeah. So like, I, I would never go, I went to officer Canada school to get my commission. So I would never compare OCS to range school as I don't think it's close, uh, but OCS is pretty tough, right? Yeah. So like we started like 120 students first night in the eight and eight and night, they smoked us like maybe two or three hours, right? You suck, you're this, you're that. And like, in, in at least OCS doesn't suck to the EO, right? They're calling all kinds of names, you know, like mm -hmm. downgrading you. Like I know these, they came to get quick, quick, 
at least 25 people quit their first night, right? Oh, yeah. So we go over 120 to 95. And then, like, the first 10 days, uh, so we wake up at 5 in the morning. You have, like, 15 minutes to do everything, right? Shower, shave. Like, of course, no one would do it, so we get smoked again. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, you forgot. You, you probably also had to clean the latrines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in 15 minutes, of course. Uh -huh. And of course, so, so whoever's the leaders in the first few weeks, they're, they're, they're toast, right? They yeah. have all these negative points. And then you go eat, eat breakfast, and like there's like 100 of us, right? You, you get 30 minutes to eat. It's mm -hmm. not each person, like, oh, yeah. Number one goes cool. through, the clock starts. So the first month, and maybe only half of us got to eat at, at all times, right? You eat one meal a day. So you do all that stuff back and forth. And then, Finally get the good bed at 10, 10 30, right? Now we go for midnight run. So midnight, they wake you up, you go for a five mile run. Of course, you know what's going on. You only you like five mile run. And of course, I think the rule there is you fall off three runs, you're out the course. So you, hmm. you know, so you you turn to do all that kind of stuff. Get back like two in the morning. Of course, you can go to sleep two in the morning because you can't take a shower, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's yeah. And and the, the instruction would mess with us, like, and you know what they're gonna do, right? So you always had to have like a uh like a canteen of water with you all the time. I right? had to always be full, right? Yeah. So one time they got me good. So they came, we're in a class, cause class are like boring as fuck, right? Like yeah. it's, it's, it's America to stay awake, right? Mm -hmm. Cause everyone passes, it's real boring. And so the instructor walks by, they call you Ken. Hey, Ken, the cabinets, you look, you look drained, whatever. Uh, I just drunk some water. Are you back talking to me, candidate? No, no, you know. And so you just can't tell you, drink the whole canteen of water. And so you know what happens next? Thirty minutes later, another, another guy comes in. Why is this empty? You know, and then we all go outside, get smoked, you know. So just those kind of things, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Ranger games. Yeah. Or the, the Army games. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I remember, like, you know, like, being in the cafeteria. And, like, we were, like, lower than low. Like, we had to go to Eddie's at, um, like, Eddie's, like, a similar respect for somebody who ranks you for private. So I walked in the mess hall, like. <laughs> yeah. Were you at Benny? Yeah, Benny, yeah. Yeah, so that was, what, 311, right? Yeah, I went. I went. I went through a uh, ninety-eight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh man, no, it, it's. I mean, it's all it's all fun and games now, but you're going through like, he dropped, and he. I, I, I recently like Rangers have dropped, Special Forces have dropped. Like I don't need this. I'm a I'm an E seven. Blah blah blah. You're like the one thing that's kind of like hypocritical, kind of hypocritical, but kind of selfish. The thing that motivated me was like I kept the retirement pay mm. un, under my bed. Right. Retirement pay for E seventy eight is this. Or major or lieutenant colonel, even a captain is this, right? So, like, man, I got a family. I was like, you know. Look, there, there's nothing, in my view, there's nothing wrong with, you know, like, that. that's not selfish, right? Like, we all have motivations yeah. and whatever's going to motivate you, right? Like, that's what's going to motivate you. And, you know, you offered this podcast to me. So, like, what I'm, the point I'm getting at here, you're not a selfish dude, yeah. right? And it's like, there's nothing wrong with wanting to enjoy the, like the fruits of your labor, you know? And, um, I think that that's a salt, like that was what motivated you. Yeah. That's not bad. That's not wrong. Right. Like <laughs> you served your nation. Bro. Yeah. And, and people don't realize the sacrifice you make too. like the OCS. Like I think around week 10 or 11, uh, I, I had a stress fracture my foot. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. Like I could run no pain, but I couldn't walk. Right. If I walk, I was on the verge of terrorists, right? Uh -huh. But the thing is, at OCS, if you get if you get recycled back to day one, like, oh yeah. So I'm not going back to day one. So like, like are, are, are you limping? No, no. I'm you not, know, so you see March. You know, as a matter of fact, I, I used to wear a size 10 boot. We had to sneak off and get me a size 12 or 13 boot for my left foot. That's how mm -hmm. big it was, right? So the last two weeks, like, man, I gotta make it. Gotta make it right. Yeah. And so many people are like doing that. At least OCS, right? Like they yeah. suck the pain. You know, this do what they gotta do, right? You drive on, right? It's like. What, what are some of the, the terms that we've got in the military? Like suffer in silence. Yeah. Just like grin and bear it. You know, that's not necessarily a, a uh, military. Of course, now looking back, probably now probably wasn't the best thing to do for your body going older. Right? But at the time, you're like, okay, I got, I got to do this right. Yeah. I can't, I can't let myself down. I can't let my family down. I can't let my other people down. One of my favorite sayings um, is from a fellow by the name of Ken Clauber, who is the founder of the Leadville 100. Uh, it's make a friend of pain and you'll never be alone. Yeah. And I, I love that because in the military or in endurance events or really anything where you're using your willpower um, to fight off, you know, that, that pain or that uncomfortable feeling, you know, you're confronted there with 
hey, do I want to quit or am I going to just soldier on? And if you accept that the pain is a part of the game and it's going to be there and you, you know, might as well just deal with it, make friends with it, then that sort of opens up the door for a, a lot of um, strength. Yeah. So after we're interested to talk about your, your actual army career a little bit, what did you, what did you do in the army? What did you accomplish, accomplish in the army before you got out? Yeah. So I had three different platoons. Um, I had a infantry rifle platoon, a striker actually. Um, and then I had two different specialty platoons, a mortar. I was a mortar PL. And then I was also the TAC platoon leader for the brigade commander. Um, so those were the three that I had. And each one taught me something new and different um, about leadership and about engaging with groups. You know, like the, the first one, um, I was Apache company, second platoon leader for Apache company, Earth Pigs. And uh, really what I learned there was, you know, if you can be a, you know, a normal guy, you know, like, and, and not a jerk, like you'll get about 85% of your element to, to follow you, you know, like those, those simple things, you know, kind of said another way, you know, you want others what you expect to be done on you, you know, or treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, so that was just my own personal experience there. And then, you know, the second platoon, the mortar platoon, highly technical, uh, highly technical area, right? You're launching 81 millimeter, 120 millimeter, 60 millimeter mortars through the air, right? Like there's, there's a lot of, a lot there's of, there's some science there, a lot of science that goes on, you know, same with artillery. And, you know, as, as an officer, my job was not to know how to do that. I need to know how they, how my, my soldiers do that. Right. But in essence, what I learned is that there's a certain point at which you're just, you're not going to know what you're doing like to down to the T um, because that's not necessarily your job as a leader. You need to be conversant, but you ultimately have to trust the people that you're working with to get the job done. You know, so when you make a team, when you craft a team or when you're given one, you got to trust unequivocally unless given a reason not to. Yeah. I remember when I was a platoon leader, I had another platoon leader, right? And like he would never do anything with soldiers. He never like he would never really speak to him. Kind of jackass. Like, mm -hmm. like it was so bad. Like he, if we were going to eat, he saw them in the restaurant. He would get up and leave. Right. And mm -hmm. Like no nothing. All right. And he could never figure out why his platoon would always figure to finish last and everything. Like he, he, he never got it right. And we said, yeah. "Dude, like be be a human. Like be nice. Like yeah. be a person. Like no, I'm off. So I'm a leader. I'm supposed to be separate. You know, I'm the leader. Blah blah." And and they would constantly like feel, I mean, like hard we feel everything, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we try to teach him and tell him, no, dude, like you gotta do it like this. And he just never got it right. And he like his platoon was lasting everything, lasting PT, lasting weapons, mm -hmm. anything that were measurable, they were finished lasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's well, it's I don't know. There's this notion that folks can't pick up on that sort of thing, which is totally wrong. Right. People are very tuned to and aware of nonverbal communication yeah. and something like 85% of communication takes place nonverbally. Yeah. You know, so it, it's, if you don't accept that, um, which can be difficult at times, right? Like I myself have struggled with that, um, still do. Um, then you miss those points and you're, you're bound to have that sort of thing happen. Question for you. Do you learn more from a good leader or do you learn more from a bad leader? Oh. You know, um, I'm torn on that, right? Because having negative, negative experiences are very easily retained in your mind, right? So it's easy to and the mind is attracted to the negative. Uh, and so when you, you see a bad leader, you can see very vividly and clearly what not to do, right? Um, but by fixating on the negative, you start to wire your brain to look at negative situations. So you know, one of the things that I've been doing for my own personal growth is trying to focus more on positivity. 
and being, you know, just emulating positive, you know, feelings and emotions. Um, and so where I might have, you know, used to, where I used to probably would have said, you know, the negative person will teach you more. The positive leader, I think, is nowadays is actually the better person, the, the better leader to learn from because that's going to create a better environment for you, right? Um, as, a, as a leader of people, right? Like you want to emulate somebody who, I would rather emulate somebody who, who does the thing right than witness what somebody else does wrong and try to say, well, let me avoid doing that. That may be a convoluted That's a good response, answer. but. So when you left the army, did you go, uh, do you, look, do you, do you go find a job? Talk about your army transition. Yeah. So I had, I had a pretty darn awesome army transition. Um, I had, had started a previous venture with my parents before I actually joined the army, um, active duty rather. And so it, it was based off of my eighth grade science project. Um, it was desalination. So water desalination, take salt water, make it fresh water. It was a novel concept that my dad and I had uh, invented together. And we founded this company back in spring of 2015, right before I assessed the active duty. And so that was going on in the background, right? So that company got formed, we got going, and I joined the army and you know, started doing my active duty career. And I would moonlight as much as I could on my spare time. And I actually came up here to Seattle and tried to find investment for GWF, Global Water Farms is the name of it. And that's, that was where I really started to dip my toe into the entrepreneurial community and world and started to really try to figure out, you know, how to make music up here in, in this space. Um, and so that really was what allowed me to have a smooth transition uh, out of the military because the, my mind was always fixated on, you know, the vision, the mission of global water farms and deploying this technology that I had invented with my father globally um, and, and to see it fix one of the most pressing issues that faces humanity, which is access to clean, fresh water. Um, so that was going, that was what was driving me, you know, that was my passion. And I saw very clearly that, you know, I could separate the military and I could go work with this company. And that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, I, I finished up my military contract, uh, my service contract that I had had from joining ROTC and being commissioned. Um, and I went to work with the company that I had formed with my parents. And so, you know, my, my transition out of the military was nice and smooth. Um, things got a little bit rocky when I went to work with Global Water Farms full time. And so you and parents, you all like co-founders, equal terms, like how did that dynamic work? Well, you see, that's, that was sort of the problem is that some of those tough founding conversations um, that folks tend to want to put on the back burner, they really end up coming back to bite you in the butt. And the magnitude can be significantly more impactful than just having the conversation up front. I mean, the fallout rather can be significantly more impactful. Um, so they, they, in my view, weren't necessarily equal terms. Um, you know, like, being one of the people who invented the core technology of this company, but not having a, a, an equal or proportionate ownership in the company, it was something that you can't do. And that's what happened. Um, you know, I, I didn't have a, a equal or at least on par ownership in a company that I- So you're not with them no, no more, right? Correct. Is yeah. the company still in business though? It is. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I, I wish the, the very best for them, right? Obviously, they're my parents, you know, and the, the technology and the purpose behind that company it is still exceedingly valuable and, and you know, I, I want to see it succeed. So how are they doing the tech piece if you're not there no more? Somebody else is doing it for them or how's that working? Uh, well, it, I mean, my father is the, the CEO. He's, you know, he, so have you ever seen Orange County Choppers? Yeah sort of envision that. Okay. Right. Um, that 
experience, you know, having that kind of working environment is what's propelled me to grow as a person and refuse to have that sort of environment um, with my new company. And, you know, those are the, the, the negative lessons that I learned that I'm trying to, you know, cut you know, cut out so of having did you go straight from global water farms to your new company or was it, was it, was there like a little break in between? No. It, so March of this year was when I actually, I resigned as the, the chief operating officer from the company. And so, you know, you're asking, well, how can it go forward techn technology wise? Well, you know, CEO has a firm handle on the technology scene as how he, you know, was one of the co-inventors of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I separated, you know, which was a very traumatic experience. Um, you know, I was very close with my dad uh, growing up. Uh, and having that happen, what I sort of felt like I was losing was that relationship with my dad. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I knew that for me personally, I'd rather focus on having a positive, like I said, a positive impact and a positive working environment that wasn't what i was seeing forming at gwf um and so i i you know set sail in a different course different direction and cast my mind to where where's my experience stand you know where, where what's my background knowledge what can i do to help better the world you know how can i leverage those things to help better the world and so you knew from Malorium. Is this a brand new idea you just came out with as a balloon after you left your last company or was something you're working on on the side at the previous company? How did this new company come about? Yeah. So, um, when I was working for GWF, one of the core things that I was working on was the power generation system that powered what we were calling the water generation system. And so it was going to be renewably powered, um, uh, the whole, the whole system, um, or water farm as they were known as, uh, or are known as. And so I was helping design a 1.5 megawatt renewable cogen power system. And so when my relationship with GWF started to devolve, I had been working in this space, the same sort of space that Melorium is now working in, which is clean power generation. And so I was able to see very clearly that all renewable power generation is geographically constrained and nowhere does it always you know, nowhere does the sun always shine nowhere does the wind always blow and nowhere do you always have biomass the key i think for renewable power adoption is having a suite of technologies that can be applied given the geographical constraints and I set my mind to developing the biomass power generation option for clean power generation up here in the Northwest. And so I'd been looking at biomass when I was at GWF as a way to meet the power demand for that tech. And I said, well, you know, this, is, this is still valid. This is still an, you know, a usable concept up here in the Northwest. So let's develop it. Let's get it pushed out. And uh, you know, like, let, let's see this thing happen. Um, Is there any significance behind the name of the company? Like how do you, like how did that, tell the story about how you got, how you named the company? Yeah. So sort of along the same lines is what I've been talking about here um, with, you know, having, having lived through a negative environment at GWF and having, um, you know, struggled there. What I wanted to do was, better myself and one of my core values has always been to better the world and make an impact where i can um and as large an impact as i can for good and so melorium in latin actually means to better to rectify or to improve and so i figured that that was sort of a fitting you know fitting name for the company um i pulled it actually from a quote of a really really good movie that i love um, it's called kingdom of heaven and 
the quote in Latin is Nemo vir est que mundum non redat melorium. And so that is what man is a man who does not make the world better. For some reason, I latched onto that quote when I first saw the movie, and it's kind of guided me throughout life. So off the subject a little bit, well, I'm actually still on the subject. You talk about your core values a few times. What, what are your core values? Yeah, um, positivity. You know, that's becoming the central theme. You know, um, betterment, so bettering the world when and where I can. Uh, giving more than I get. You know, those are, those are you know, off the top of my head, the, the core ones that guide me. Uh, my experience, my background in outdoors is what guided me to environmental, to the environmental path. And right now we're facing a large problem globally with, with climate change, right? Regardless of what your beliefs are, it's happening, right? Whether or not it's anthropogenically caused or not, it's a different story. The question is whether or not we want to actually step in and, and use the tools and the, you know, the brain that we have fix and solve a very large issue um, that has a large potential to drastically alter the, the systems and mechanisms that we've built as a society to enjoy you know, heat, indoor plumbing, right? Like a nice feather bed, right? Like when climate change has this, this I'm getting a little off topic here. Um, climate change has the possibility to drastically change and cast into uncertainty um, the mechanisms that we've built our society upon. Access to energy, um, land, droughts, water, access to water. You know, those core necessities are starting to be called into question. And you can see that play out in California where you have farmers that are struggling to find water to irrigate their lands. You know, California, the Imperial and Central Valleys are one of our largest farmlands for vegetables, for leafy vegetables. And, and if, we don't have, if we don't have those basic needs met, um, given the infrastructure that we've already put in place, then that's gonna require a significant amount of future investment and change and you know the destabilization of that is what can cause problems moving forward so sorry i got off no, topic no that's fine pontificating yeah well, well climate change i think with anything else i think if climate change i think if we get rid of the one percent extremists on one side on the other side like oh, the one one person on one side like like some people like, oh, just burn oil do this do that you know keep mm -hmm. on going like that doesn't work uh, the other side this is the one person like oh Let's go back to the 1500s and yeah. nothing like, you know, live like the 1500s. Like, that's not going to work either, right? Exactly. You know, so like, it has to be some kind of balance, some kind of way. I, I would say to, to the, you know, the 1% on the ex extreme left side, you know, it's like, do you live in a house? Like, do you have heat? Do you have plumbing? Do you have a nice mattress and like a comforter and a bed, right? Like, because all of those are luxuries. You don't need all of those. You and I know that we yep. both slept on the ground on tree roots. Yeah. You know, it sure as shit sucks. That sucks. I can tell you that 100% matter of factly sleeping in the rain sucks. I don't want to do that. I accept the fact that I don't want to do that. Yeah. And I'm going to try to find the solutions that allow me to keep that level. I mean, there's a reason where the death rate was like so high in the 1500s, right? Mm-hmm. What was a life space like maybe 40, 50 years old? Yeah, right. So it's, I've always thought that environmental engineering, just generally engineering, is about finding ways to meet society's issues, to, to solve the problems mechanically that are facing society, um, but in a you know, sustainable manner. So it all kind of like wrapping it, bringing it back, to, you know, um, full circle to you know, talking about hunting. Um, we are part of mother nature. We're, we're part of that natural order. We also should, I think, given the fact that we're very smart as human beings, I think we should persevere to, to try to live within that mm -hmm. to some regard. Um, you know, I, I don't want to 
personally don't want to have our species be, uh, you know, in charge of another mass extinction along the lines of like, you know, that happened with dinosaurs. Yeah. You know, like maybe I'm getting really kind of off topic and crazy here, but no, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it has to be some solution. Like, like, like me, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a, like a agronomist by far, but you know, I don't want clean water. I want yeah. clean food. I don't want like, you know, a species of animals that die off because what humans do, you know, yeah. But then again, you know, you gotta, you know, what you, how, I mean, like, yes, you know, it's about striking the balance. And whatever is this part of natural, because I, I read some things where it says like this, this is a natural order thing. Like this happens like every like thousands of years, right? That something happens like this, right? Is that true? How, how do we know, right? Or, yeah, or, I mean, like, or is it is it really all the greenhouse gases? You know, I, I don't know. Well, and the, exactly right. So it's like, well, yes, the Earth is cyclical. It does have freezing and thawing periods, you know, where, and and we can't get around that. The question I think is whether or not number one, we want to be the cause of that. And if we have the capacity to keep the system stable, yeah, should we step in and help achieve that? You know, be, and it, cause it just, boils, it just boils down. That's to, a good point. Should we step in? Is that, is that our role right? or is this cynical? But then you, you see yeah. like having New York city and New Jersey, like what last weekend for the storm, like, like, Things like that used to not never happen, right? It, it, yeah, and it's all about loss of life, right? That's really ultimately what it boils down to. It's conflict and loss of life, right? So are we willing to just continue to, to kick the can down the road? Because the further we kick the can down the road, the more severe loss of life is going to be um, because it's that destabilization of the systems of, you know, whether or not it's systems of government, whether or not it's systems of, distribution of water to a populace mm -hmm. you know those are the systems that i think as we as climate change gets more and more um prevalent that start to 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 crack yeah because if you if if imperial irrigation districts can't rely on receiving 3.9 million acre feet of water a year from the colorado river they've got to figure out a different way to serve their irrigational district with water, right? The need doesn't go away, but that's gonna require a lot of either investment or change in how they source it. But that's just you know, one example. Power distribution is a whole other example, right? Like, it just, it's on us to, I think, ask ourselves, do we want to see mass migrations? Do we want to see conflicts start to crop up over the, the, the finite resources that we have? Or do we want to try to step in and find the ways to, to yeah. meet our basic needs? In this society, you, you just have to trust that smart people are figuring this out. Not only smart people, smart people have everyone's best interests at heart. Like it can be a smart person who like takes a bribe or has a terror motive, right? Or like, I know a big thing now, it with all stuff going COVID, a lot of people like trust the science, but like I really mean, but what science, you know, the science of the vaccine makers, the science of these people, like there's different sciences, right? So wh who do you trust, right? Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's why science is peer reviewed, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you have the group, I mean, science at its basic is just asking a question. And that's a, that's a good point. A lot of people think science is like 100% backed all the time. No, no, it's like, it's always getting peer reviewed. I know the army, I did HR and the army reset was saying, I know yesterday I told you this, but the truth, that was the truth yesterday, today the truth changed, right? I think the same thing with science, right? Yeah. What was science yesterday, that science might change today, right? Based on new findings, new what peer review. Exactly, right? The science that we have is built on the shoulders of scientists from decades, mm -hmm. centuries, millennia ago, right? Like, so it's just continuously evolving and growing. And all it is at its foundation is an inquisitive mind asking a question and trying to find a way to answer that question. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, is climate change causing an environmental problem for the earth, you know, for us as humans, for you know, what myriad of, you know, what, put in the blank, fill in the blank, yeah. whatever you want to put there, right? Or like, you know, 
is this vaccine safe? And so like to, to really be able to answer that question, you have to go read through those studies. Yeah. You have to go read through those experiments. And you know, personally, I, 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 tr- I trust that peer review process. You know, I trust that foundational process um, that leads to pretty much everything that we, the, the natural order of things. Yeah. Right. The, that process is what's made these microphones that yeah. we're talking through, right. Made the computers that, that we. And what kills me when people say I'm not going to put the vaccine in my body, right. It's not FDA approved. That cigarette you're smoking ain't FDA approved. Like as, and I'm in the middle of the military, like how many vac- how many shots we got in the military, right. I, there's no telling what's in my body, right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Morphine. I'm not morphine shots, but I'm malaria, malaria shots, malaria pills, I was, anthrax. I was talking to my girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. I was talking to my girlfriend about how, you know, her, her um, organization was, you know, looking at mandating vaccinations for employees and whatnot. And I was like, I kind of got a little bit of a giggle because it's like, well, <laughs> army doesn't even give you a choice, you know, it's yep, like, line up. Yeah. It's, it's not even the choice of like, yeah, you don't want this. Well, here's the door. It's like, no, you're getting it. Yeah. You don't even get a door. No, <laughs> you're just getting the vaccine, you know, with the smallpox and the so and all that. kind of the subject. How you talking about like all, all stuff is like built other things, and I'm assuming what I'm going to tell you is true because I read it on um, and it wasn't on Facebook. It was like LinkedIn or somewhere else, and I was telling the story of how like um, the 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 booster rockets. Well, some kind of rocket, like a certain size, right? And the plant who made them in Colorado actually wanted it to be bigger, right? Mm-hmm. But they had to make them smaller because that'd be smaller to fit on the train cars that's going to ship it from Colorado to Houston, right? Yeah. And they'd be like, well, why are the train cars this size? Well, the train cars, the rail, the rail was this size because the, the Americans made it like way back in the why, why? Why? Yeah. Well, the English actually came over and engineered it back in the 1800s, right? Mm-hmm. So why? Well, because they based on the roads in England. Why? Well, because the Romans, when they invaded England, had a road transfer back and forth. They made the roads to be uh, a chariot wide, two horses asses ride, right? Yeah. So the joke was our, 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 our rocket boosters in 2021 are the size of two horses ass, based on what the Romans did in the, in the, like the, in the, in the, in the, in the BC, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like, I think if you backtrack anything like that, it's yeah. going to be some kind of story, right? Right. Well, it's, it's because, again, it's we build off of our foundations, mm-hmm. right? And so you can backtrack it all the way as, as far as you want to go, right? It's just what it boils down to is a person had a problem that was related to and he came up with the best solution he could at the time, exactly. and it worked, and, and it continued it, to work, you know. So it's just the natural evolution or progression of our own tools and our own hardware and our own systems, you know, like moving forward, and so. I think that's, that, that's awesome. You know, like, that's cool. <laughs> I mean, what a story, right? I mean, what, I mean, maybe it's not true. Maybe it is, but just a story like rocket boosters yeah. are based on two charity asses from based on Roman empire days. Right. Yeah. Like, are you, are you kidding me? Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, just, are you kidding me right now? Just keep asking why just keep going. And you'll, that, why is my favorite question? Yeah. One, one thing, like, I think the Roman empire is like very, very undervalued in all the industry piece they did. Right. I mean, mm. I mean, back then the stuff they did, like the, Echo the water thing they did, the roads. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, I mean, master engineers, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And so, like, the aqueducts from Roman time, right? It's like, need, what do you need? Water, shelter. For the whole empire. Food. How do we get water to the whole empire? Yeah. Right. So, like, back in Roman times, those were, those were the three foundational needs, necessities for no matter who you were, right? Food, shelter, water. Um, I think today, now it's, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs can be expanded by one, food, yeah. shelter, water, and electricity or energy yeah. right um but yeah i mean they just somebody sat there and said how the hell are we gonna do this and then folks a generation later said hey you know like well that's cool how can we improve it or how yeah. can we change it to fit our current need and then you know, fast forward a couple thousand years and you got a rocket going through or on a rail car that's two chariots wide <laughs> Definitely crazy. So um, let's go back to your company, Malorium. Can you talk for, um, in detail as much as you want? Like, and you already talked about some of this already, but 
how the company got started. Yeah. What are you working on right now? And what's your vision for the company? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the company got started right um, based off of, of not having that tough founder conversation um, with my parents and not even knowing to do that. Uh, when I was what I gosh, 21, 22. Um, and that conflict sent me on my way for personal growth to form Melorium. And you know, Melorium is about clean power generation using biomass and about soil additives to boost agricultural productivity. All right. So what I'm looking to try to do is you know, I've wanted to find where I can make an impact, a large impact on uh, it to help society move it along and address one of our larger issues, climate change, right? And so energy being a base need, food being a base need, those, you know, when you talk about what's your target market as a company, when you're working with basic needs, it's everybody, right? I, you know, I saw that when I was working with global water farms on, you know, trying to find a way to serve the basic need for water. Um, you know, so that was what the company was started for. It was just, Hey, how can I make the world a better place? And I used my skills, my background, knowledge, and understanding, uh, you know, of environmental engineering to find a product that I believed in that so I was skilled enough to bring forward um, and move forward. And so that, that was what started Melorium. So as a team, is, is you by yourself still? You have members helping you out? or? Yeah. So right now, in terms of like full-term employees, it, it's, you know, it's just me. But, um, yeah, I have a very large support network. You know, my, uh, my, my girlfriend being one of those, you know, um, we, we actually work in the same uh, room back at, in her house, you know, with everybody doing remote work and whatnot. And, you know, like I'll either have a success and I get to immediately turn to her and shout it out, you know, and be like, yeah. Or like, if I have a problem, I'll turn to her and, just, you know, we'll, we'll talk through it and game it a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, the, the team right now is kind of just that little support network and, and me. Um, and you just finished like some kind of a prototype, right? Correct. Yeah. Talk so, about that. Yeah, so uh, what I've got here is I call it the M Pro Lorian prototype. It is a four kilowatt downdraft gasifier system. So it, it takes wood chips, you feed it through what's called a gasifier, and you get a combustible gas known as syngas, and then you get a um, another byproduct called biochar. That syngas you send to a generator or a boiler. And that will create electricity or heat for you know, the customer, um, you know, whether or not you need power or, or um, you know, heat to, to radiate heating in your house or something like that. And then the biochar is the soil additive that I was talking about that helps boost plant, predict, plant production and productivity uh, by creating a healthier soil environment for plants to grow in. It boosts the microbial environment and facilitates nutrient absorption within the soil. And this can be done anywhere, any kind of environment, any type of whatever. Yeah. So the like I was saying, renewables are geographically constrained. And so if you're going to deploy this system, you have to have an area where there's a large enough amount of biomass. You know, so biomass is, you know, like trees, bushes, um, like compost kind of stuff. What you, what you look for in this system, though, is woody cellulose-based products that have low moisture content because you're burning it. Um, and what you're doing is you, you're, you're burning it in an oxygen-deprived state so that it creates that syngas that you then collect and you're able to burn um, or combust to, to achieve your electricity demand or need. And so the other thing about this, right, is that that biochar is pure carbon. And so you're actually, by introducing it into the soil, you're able to sequester that carbon. And so instead of just sending this biomass to a landfill where it will decay and ends up becoming um, 
either methane or carbon dioxide that's released in the atmosphere, what you're actually doing is you're locking up that carbon in the soil for anywhere from a decade, or excuse me, from a century to a millennia. And so it's a very stable, steady way to sequester carbon, um, which again, for climate change and, and looking at that you know, going forward, um, is very beneficial. In fact, the International Panel on Climate Change from the UN has stated that biochar is a solution to combat climate change. So when you talk to people about your company, what kind of pushback do you get? So I, actually, what I've seen talking to you know, folks on, on the street in my neighborhood, actually, because that's, that's where my prototype is right now, um, it, it's, it's been a lot of, yes, we need this. You know, like this is the sort of solution that's needed to help us. Um, you know, and, and so I, I'm seeing that the public, you know, wants it. Um, what has been lacking is the economical and efficient mechanisms to facilitate a transition to renewables. You know, so right now, if you're, if you're a residential customer and you want to power your house off of renewables, you have a limited number of options. It's pretty much just like solar, right? Like that's pretty much all you get to use. The, the larger the entity gets, you know, if you start working at utility level scale, that's where you start to see the field open up and you have different sources of renewable power generation come into play. But the general customer, um, who's who's trying to be you know, renewably or climate conscious has limited solutions and it's, like i said just solar um predominantly and up in the pacific northwest where it's a rainforest and you know once once winter hits or fall hits and it, you know, the clouds turn on they don't really stop until like springtime um solar doesn't necessarily make the most sense in western washington but because it doesn't, we have a lot of trees, like all of that rain, right? All that rain makes biomass. So that's the key in my belief, in my view, right? The key is to provide the solution that is geographically smart for here. And so that's what Melorium is working on doing. And anywhere else where there's a large abundance of biomass, this, this solution works. Who is your target customer? Well, food and, and energy. So you know, my vision for the company is, you know, one of these systems deployed holistically for communities and for small you know, residents. So you, know, you, Jason Kavnis, you could be my customer if you wanted clean power generation on your house. You know, um, an HOA, uh, you know, a homeowners association that wants to convert all of their homes to renewable power generation and wants to have grid stability. You know, they could be a customer. A industrial warehouse, you know, a corporation, they could be customers. Utility providers. Here in the state of Washington, utility providers are regulated or mandated by the Clean Energy Transformation Act to have a portion of their energy generation come from renewable power generation. Uh, right now, I think it's like 15%. You know, so the, the customers for the energy systems, it, you know, ultimately, I envision it being everybody where it makes sense geographically. And so eventually, I mean, if things go right, eventually you're going to have to mass produce this, right? Mm -hmm. And you, how are you going to plan on doing that? You're going to have like some kind of, you know, also some kind of some kind of factory to make it for you or how do you plan on doing that yeah yeah I'm, i mean factories manufacturing um automation that that's key that's central right that that's central for any mass production facility um and i, I don't see that being any different with you know, with melorium um the let me let me transition here because i have a whole other product that does have a definitive market for, um, for adoption. And that's that biochar that I was talking about. Um, that market right there is predominantly agricultural producers, gardeners, you know, home gardeners, um, you know, 
folks like that, folks that are trying to grow the food for, for their community or for America. Um, like I was saying, I, you know, there's, there's a lack of understanding about how biochar affects specific crops and to what extent you can start to achieve um, yield increases. And that's, you know, I'm getting a little bit more specific again on and off topic, but that, that's where the growth of this industry is lacking, right? Like that's what's lacking to prevent the growth of this industry. I mean, um, is having an understanding about, you know, if I put this stuff down on my land as you know, Farmer Joe, I can expect to see 15% increase on my corn production. You know, does that 15% increase justify the cost of putting biochar down on the land? You know, that's, that's a specific thing that I'm working on for, the, for my company, but um, biochar, ag producers, farmers, growers, people who are trying to make food. Can you talk some about how you did your user research, how you validated your idea for your company? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm still in the process of validating, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's honestly, it's a constant process, I think, right? Cause if, if you get done with one product, you should continue to improve it and refine it and then go on to the next thing. But, um, my trigger personally for essentially devoting the, for devoting my own personal capital to this project, you know, that, that is Melorium, uh, was figuring out the economics, the general economics, and whether or not this idea had legs to stand on in our current society, right? So it was doing an in-depth analysis, trying like scouring the internet, trying to figure out, you know, what does the average Washingtonian use in terms of energy on a daily basis? How much does that average Washingtonian pay for energy on a daily basis? You know, how much is it going to cost a, you know, how, how much is it going to cost me to produce that electricity for them? Is it, does it make sense? Like, am I actually providing an advantage? over my competition? Is it close enough that I'm, you know, with continued advancement and with refinement of my system, am I going to be competitive? You know, when I reached that point and I saw that, yes, yes, you know, with work, with advancement, with refinement, you have a product that, you know, is competitive and customers will find value in. That's when I pulled the trigger and said, yeah, all right, I'm going to order all of the equipment for my my prototype. Is your plan to bootstrap as long as you can, fundraise, get a small business loan? What's your plan as far as like capital? Yeah. So, so right now I'm actually angling to have a product launch for what's called Becker's Better Dirt, uh, which will be a topsoil and biochar mix. Um, you know, so you put that down on like your lawn um, or like a garden bed. And then if you have, you know, grass, what happens in the summertime over here in Washington, everybody's grass turns dead or goes dormant because it doesn't have water, right? Well, biochar absorbs water and the moisture locks it in. So, you know, you put down this Becker's better dirt. And the idea here is that you're going to have a greener lawn longer before, you know, like before you start to see it die. You know, you know no, it's funny. Like whenever someone visits from out of the state of Washington, there's someone like, I thought the grass was always green here. What's going on with this, right? You get all the rain, right? And we explain to them, right, what, how it works. <laughs> or it doesn't work a better, better thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They were always surprised they come visit us in, in the summertime. Like, what? Like, it's not raining? <laughs> no, no, no. Summertime is actually really pretty nice. Yeah. So the, the, the plan is, you know, basically getting the profitability as quickly as possible. Right? That's always the goal. And what I'm trying to do here is, is sell this this product and gain enough traction and revenue from that to e either offset the cost of buying my prototype um, and then having that foundation to be able to approach investors to you know, essentially supercharge um, you know, adoption of the biochar concurrent to product development and refinement of Melorium Energy Systems. Uh, and so with those two things going on concurrently, you know, that's kind of my plan. That's my goal. 
I want to be able to show that you know, with the, I want to be able to show, hey, you know, we've got stuff going on. We've got traction. The biochar market is good. Now, the question is, hey, how can you reach production levels for this biochar system and market using Melorium energy systems that help transition Washington off of fossil fuel power gen to clean power gen? And so, you know, that, that's, that's the balancing act that's going on right now. Um, and that's sort of my strategy. I want to get to the point where, you know, I've, I've, I do foresee reaching out into capital markets and, you know, and working with investors. Um, but from a position not where I'm saying, hey, just give me this because, you know, this is going to allow me to start to refine the product. It's going to be, hey, give me this, this money, what I'm asking for, because with this money, I'm going to be able to capture significant market share of the biochar market here in Washington. And then I'm going to be able to develop the production capacity, the, the system that will develop the production capacity to continue to you know, feed the biochar market. Who else is doing this? Like who are your competitors? Like Yeah, so there, there's 136 folks uh, that produce biochar throughout okay the united states and i think that might even be global you know so that's not a lot no it's not that's not a lot of folks at all um you know think about how many different types of um i mean there's probably 136 marketing companies this in seattle you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> at right? least and so when you start, and that actually, that number gets even smaller when you start talking about, hey, how many companies are there that's working in the biochar market as well as the energy production market? That, you know, that number goes down. Um, so there, there are competitors, but what I'm seeing is, and what I've done in my research or what I've noticed in my research is that the, this industry is in its infancy. Um, because a lot of folks don't don't know about what biochar is. There, there, there just is not marketing out there. There's not base level knowledge. Um, and so that's where the opportunity is that I've seen. And it, that, you know, I got into Melorium thinking that it was going to be entirely about clean power gen and that the biochar aspect would be a, a secondary thought. You know, it'd be like a cream on the top. Like, hey, if we sell this byproduct, we'll be groovy. And up here in Washington, what I'm starting to notice is that it's actually the other way around. Um, energy generation systems are what will fuel the production capacity for biochar. Because um, right now the, the price is too high for general consumer and for farm consumer. Um, wholesale price for char is $1,300 roughly uh, per ton, $1,300 per ton. And it takes somewhere on the order like five to 15 tons for an acre. Okay. That's a lot of money for a farmer. That's a lot of money. And if you're only getting 10% increase in your crop production, yeah, that's not good enough to justify that price. So how do you, how do you bring production? How do you ramp up production while, without ramping up cost of production to bring the price down so that you can actually have this, this additive used on a mass market? So right now the folks that buy it, it it's, it's a boutique sort of thing. Um, it's not large scale. It's, it hasn't been adopted. So that's the, the question that I am working to solve uh, right there. And that's you know what any form of capital would be used to answer. Uh, and I think I have the answer. I think I do, right? But much like we were talking about with scientists, just starts with knowing what the question is you want to answer and then getting the resources 
you know, the, the beakers, the test tubes, the, the experiment documented for you to get the, the data to see if you've got an answer to that question. And that's what, that's what every entrepreneur is doing. They're essentially scientists by a different name. And instead of doing, you know, trying to figure out the natural world, they're just trying to figure out the business world. And so, you know, you do that background research ahead of time to see if you can't minimize the amount of impact and capital that you need to, you know, to go forward. So to bring it back to your question, um, you know, what's, what's the direction, what's the path? Bootstrap as long as possible to gain as much traction as possible. Seek capital to answer that question definitively to get out to capitalize and gain as much market share as possible. From your point of view, talk about some of the pros and some of the cons of being an entrepreneur. Well, the, the pros are certainly, for me, they've, they've far outweighed the cons. Um, you know, you are the master of your own fate, right? Um, there's a lot of folks that fail in the entrepreneurial community, <laughs> um, but it has the draw because nowhere do you have the ability, nowhere else that, that I've seen, do you have the ability to craft your own lifestyle the way that you want and be the master of your own success or failure. And that's ultimately what it boils down to. You are the person who's in charge of your own success or your own failure here as an entrepreneur, right? You have nobody else to really turn to at the end of the day and say, you know, like, well, it's that person's fault. And so in essence, it, it's, you're going to be, it, you're, you're <laughs> um, Big, like uh, big boy games, I guess. Yeah. Like I, I don't know how I'm, I'm struggling to, you know, say what I'm trying to say here, but um, big boy rules. There you go. You know, um, what I noticed is when I was in the military, is that there can be a tendency to towards apathy. Um, you don't necessarily, if you're trying to make a successful business as an entrepreneur, you don't have that luxury. You know, so that's one of those like good or bad, depending on how you want to look at it. That's one of those aspects of the entrepreneurial community. You don't get to be apathetic because your own livelihood depends on it. Depends on you putting in your effort, you waking up at four o'clock, Jason, <laughs> and making your way up here to host the podcast, you know, and, and to get your name out there. Like that's the sort of thing that it depends on your mindset are you going to view that as a pro or are you going to view that as a con? I view that as a pro, right? I have control of my own schedule, but because of that, I don't have anybody to blame if I don't, you know, if I don't become that success, if I don't make it happen. It's on me. So coach, so we're both a part of a program called Bunker Labs Veterans Residence. Can you talk about that some? Like why do you apply for veterans residence if I can involve Bunker Labs and what do you, what do you get out of it? Yeah. Yeah, so I applied to Bunker Lab. Actually, the, my first experience with Bunker Labs was with Global Water Farms. I met Jake Tozier at a um, a, a little event for transitioning better um, or active duty soldiers transitioning out of the military. Um, and so that was my first interaction with Bunker. And you know, fast forward, I think about four years now, and I'm just like, the community here is is awesome. Um, cause you're working with folks that, you know, have gone through similar experiences and can relate and it can be scary being an entrepreneur without having a support system like that folks that you feel comfortable being around. Um, you know, like walking into a, a VC pitch can, can be pretty freaking terrifying, you know? But like being able to get done with that or, you know, getting prepared for that in advance by chatting with fellow, you know, um, veterans who, who have your back 
because that's been ingrained in them, you know, that's the benefit. That's the beauty. Of, and I think kind of the core of what Bunker is trying to achieve with their mission, you know, creating an environment where entrepreneur, veteran entrepreneurs feel comfortable talking to each other and discussing their issues that they're facing to, to bring forth their ideas for the betterment of society. Yes. And actually here at Bunker Labs, we're actually taking applications for next veterans residence program. Uh, applications open from sem- September 1st to September 30th. Uh, so you're, you're, uh, when I say military veteran, I actually mean military connected. You mean like, you know, military veteran, retiree, military spouse dependent, you know, anything like that. As long as you're an entrepreneur, entrepreneur. Uh, only, only qualification, you have to have an LLC. So you can't just have an idea. You, have to have to, you just have to have LLC. And it's a great experience. Like you get free access to reward for six months and, and different benefits to it. So we're taking applications now. So, Coach, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? No, I'm, I mean, I'm just excited to have had the, um, you know, to have had the experience here with you and, and to have been given the opportunity. So, you know, thank you for helping me grow and, you know, push out of my comfort zone and, and whatnot. No, you know, like that's, that's part of what Bunker Labs is, yeah. is able to do. And that's the benefit of it. Right. Um, you don't, you don't accomplish great things just sitting on your couch, you know, hanging out by yourself. Yeah. Um, you need to engage. And so, you know, thank you for providing the opportunity to engage. No, thank you. And another good thing about Bunker Labs is like, it's like, it's, it's so many companies with different ideas, they're working on different things, right? You see, so you get different aspects of different perspectives, right? Even as we are here in Seattle, like you're yeah. doing your business. Uh, Makita has her, her, her barbecue sauce business. Mm-hmm. Samir has his app, you know, um, Jay has a business and all, all different points of view, different areas, different revenue streams. So you get to see, you know, everyone has a different perspective and you get to take everything in. Mm-hmm. But the beauty of what makes it all work is that the, the backdrop is business. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're running a, a sauce company or a you know consulting firm or an HR business or you know trying to sell a a thorium energy system, right? Like that doesn't matter because the core concepts of business still yeah. apply. Yeah, everyone it's, has to validate the idea, do user research. You gotta pick a name out, gotta pick a logo. I mean, you gotta get up in front of people, complete strangers, and you know, sell them on your idea. It's yeah. And so Again, it's that the beauty of bunkers having that environment where you can just start to put yourself out there and it's low threat, you know, and you're you're gonna be met with support rather than ridicule. Yes. Colton, can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah, yeah. So you can reach me on LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn.com. What is it? Backslash and then Colton Beck. Um, and then, uh, you know, right now we're, I was going through product dev, so I don't actually have a website up. So um, really that's the only social media that I have. And then in terms of contact information, it's just colton.e.becker at gmail.com in terms of getting a hold of me. Yes. And for listeners who have the links to our social media on show notes, you find the show notes at www.cabinetstoblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and network and be sure to subscribe to the Jason Cabinet Experience on whatever platform you use. So Colton, we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice and wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, well, the only advice that I can, meaningful advice, I think, is really just focusing, again, on giving more than you get. Um, but when, I was, when I was facing my um, part times at Ranger School, that was the one thing that, I kept seeing would would actually bear some form of fruit, right? If you focus your energy and your efforts on the person to your left and to your right, um, and you help them out when and where you can, however you can, then this weird thing happens where, you know, you might be thinking that it's, you know, Hey, I'm devoting my resources to somebody else, but really what you're doing is you're creating a, a positive community, a, a, you know, a community that wants to support you um, because you're willing to support them. And so if you focus on that, then you know, crazy things happen. So that's great advice, Colton. But here, here's a question for you. I asked, I've been asking lately, right? 
And I, I, can, I think I already know you, what your answer is going to be. So, you know, you, you're like, you're saying give value, give value, give value, you know, convince someone's going to give value back to you. Mm-hmm. What do you do in the case, like you're dealing with someone and you do stuff for them all the time, right? You, you yeah. do favors over and over again. Yeah. And they never do anything for you. Ask for stuff, like, I can't do it. Do you just keep on giving, giving, giving? Or is there like, is there, yeah. should it be a cutoff point? Yeah, I think there should. Um, so, you know, my second platoon, like I was telling you, was a mortar platoon. That was where I realized you know, trust unequivocally unless given a reason not to. Mm-hmm. So that's that asterisk, that last part, the unless given a reason not to. You know, if if you're dealing with a jerk, somebody who's violating your trust or violating, you know, your um, your help in essence, isn't, you know, it has shown time and time again that they're not willing to reciprocate in some level. Yeah, like that's black hole. Avoid black holes like that for sure, right? Um, So that's that unless given a reason to. So if a person's showing you that reason, then yeah, like I think you will find that you're not the only person who probably shares that opinion about that person. Yeah. Um, and last last question for you out of here. So your company, uh, what's today? Today's like shit, August, September eighth or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So like six months from now, what's say February eighth? What needs to happen on February 8th for you to say those previous six months have been a success? Ooh. You know, at the end of the day, I just need to be working on, on Maloran. Yeah. Um, and I will consider it a success. Okay. Right? Because uh, between now and then, I have no idea, right? Like what road, road blocks or speed bumps, rather, I will have encountered. But my goal will just be to have not quit. Okay. To not give up, to continue to pursue my desire, my passion, my purpose. Um, this is one of my other values that I've neglected to mention. Purpose is paramount. And so, so long as I'm continuing driving towards that goal, I consider it a success. So, in your, here's another question for you what's, what's your red line? Like, what's your stopping point? Like, mine actually is my wife's red line. It's not, we're not going to mortgage a house, right? Mm-hmm. So, is your, yeah. do you have, I think every entrepreneur needs a red line, right? Is there under red line? Like, if you have if you succeed like six years in a stop, or do you, do you have a red line in mind? Or are you just going to keep on going until you, you know? That's, that's it, man. Okay. Yeah, that right there, right? If, if you care enough about it and you desire it enough, you'll do what's necessary to achieve that goal, right? An example for you, a definitive example. I ran the lead bill 100. I got the belt buckle on right now, right? I carry this thing around with me as a constant reminder, daily reminder. You have the capacity to do whatever you want to do. You have the capacity to achieve it. It's not going to be easy, but you sure as shit can do it. You just got to accept that it's going to take the work beforehand. You know, it's not given to you for free. You know, everything costs something. So for me, you know, if I have to like, if I have to moonlight, I already moonlight. Right? I was doing that with GWF when I was in the army. Right. So whatever it takes, that's what I'm you know, willing to put in. And if it takes, you know, 10 years, 15 years to achieve my goal, you know, and, and, and see this thing come to fruition. And that's what it takes, you know, and I, I totally get what you're saying. You know, uh, some folks, they've got that red line. And all I would say is that if you're creative enough and you think through it enough, you'll find the solutions. You know, like if you, if you bump up into a wall, the beauty of that wall is it showed you that's not the way. Don't stop. Don't give up. Just find a different route. Yeah, go around, you know. It's like in land nav, the army, you, you're doing land nav, and you go, oh, shit, there's like a pond here. Yeah. I can't go to the pond. You just go around or, you know. Yeah, like, don't stop. Don't stop going forward. Like, yeah, it might take you longer. It might take you a hell of a lot longer than you were hoping. But that's where that no quit perseverance mindset and determination comes in. And that's what makes you know, the, the veteran community such a valuable business community right, is because that's built into the ethos already. 
Colton, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. I really appreciate chatting with you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.